Good evening and welcome to Last Orders with me, Joe Pike, and our two MPs coming up on tonight's programme. Building the Northern Powerhouse. The Northern Powerhouse. Part of the Northern Powerhouse. The Northern Powerhouse. Five years after it was first launched, has the Northern Powerhouse project fizzled out? We'll ask the man who's now in charge of it. As Waynefleet becomes the latest community to bear the brunt of flooding, are we doing enough to prevent it? And where does the Tory leadership contest and the results of the European elections leave Brexit? We will of course ask our MPs what on earth is going to happen next. Joining me tonight are the Labour MP for York Central, Rachel Maskell and Kevin Hollenrake, the MP, a Conservative of course, for Thurston and Moulton. Good evening to you both. But first tonight, this Sunday will mark half a decade since George Osborne, then Chancellor and now newspaper editor, first used the phrase Northern Powerhouse. There were proud promises of more money and deeper devolution. But five years on, is the idea firing on all cylinders or has it fizzled out? Earlier today, I put that question to the government's Northern Powerhouse minister, Jake Barry. No, I don't accept it has, and I would point to lots of things that are happening all over the north, including devolution in Sheffield and an exciting deal that we've done in the Leeds City region, because actually it's this government who launched the Northern Powerhouse and said to people living across the north of England, look, continuing with that north-south divide is unacceptable. We want people who live in the north of England to have exactly the same life chances as people who live anywhere else in the country. It's not about dragging London and the South down, it's about pulling our whole country up. Theresa May's support for this project, certainly compared to David Cameron and George Osborne, her support seems to be lukewarm. And the guy who could be our next Prime Minister, who you want to be our next Prime Minister, is considering scrapping HS2, which would be an important high-speed link for our region. Well, Theresa May has always been very helpful for me in this job and in fact one of the last things she did as Prime Minister was to take this job from the Communities Department to make it a cross-governmental job by putting me in the Business Department as well and I think that shows her long-term commitment. In relation to people who are seeking to become the next leader of the Conservative Party, this government remains absolutely committed to HS2. To me, it is so important to drive the northern economy, not actually because we want to get to London quicker, but because it is the key that unlocks for us in the north of England that east-west connected. And you'll know the problems we've had in our coverage on calendar with uh, pretty poor uh, train services over the past year or so. And of course, buses don't seem to be being invested in either. It's not a good experience for travellers in our region. Well, what we've done, and I think, you know, it's, it does take a long time to change these things. What we've done is we set up this thing called Transport for the North. That now means that Northern Transport is run by leaders across the north of England, most importantly, of course, Metro, of course, Metro Mayors, and for things like the Northern Rail front. Franchise. In fact, they are co-running that franchise with the government. And I hope over time those northern voices driving our local transport solutions will transform our network. And this month, Bob Kerslake's report talked about the regional divide, the divide between north and south, and suggested that, that is getting worse. We went to the Dern Valley to talk to a couple of people. I wanted to show you what they were saying. Don Keating joins other volunteers to pick litter every weekend in the village of Brampton and others nearby. In the current economic climate, if they didn't do it, nobody else would. We're stood now in the what, what they used to say is the uh, largest industrial wasteland, not in Britain, but in Europe. Now there's five pits within a few miles of here, all along the Dern Valley. And it was just absolutely disgraceful. The landscapes were disgraceful. Today, a shopping centre stands on the former colliery site. But the visual improvements to this landscape hide deprivation, which people here say is getting worse. Deprivation has got really bad. Um, we're getting a lot more people coming into the centre for help. Um, people are struggling financially. Um, not just financially, but obviously they have lots of other problems, which has a knock-on effect. So we have a lot of people with mental health issues because because deprivation is so high. Jake Berry, what would you say to Don and Shelley there? Well, I think that really demonstrates the story of the North in many ways. First of all, we saw about sort of industrial strife and deindustrialization, and just down the road from there, of course, we have the Advanced Manufacturing Centre in Sheffield. That, to me, is totemic of everything we've achieved in the Northern Powerhouse. It was, of course, the site of the Orgreave coking plant. It now has McLaren on there, other world-class manufacturers creating high-paid, you know, really good 
jobs in the green economy, that to me is what the renaissance of the north is about and I think you can demonstrate that by the improvement that you've seen uh, just in that clip with the pit being replaced by new development. That I think has to be what our ambition for the north is about. More widely about local authorities and funding, I'm really pleased that funding for all local authorities is going up in real terms this year. They have had a, a very challenging period in terms of their funding and I think we need to ensure that through things like devolution that we give much more control of more funding streams to authorities across the north of England because in fact they are the people who are best placed to choose their local priorities about how they support their communities. Kevin Hollenrake, has our region seen any tangible benefit from that scheme in the last five years? Yeah, that's £13 billion of transport investment for starters, but I would be the first to admit I was one of 82 parliamentarians that wrote to the Chancellor quite recently to support Transport for the North Strategic Transport Plan. The key thing is transport, connecting all those cities across the North in a way that London's connected. So if we can do that, and that requires a long-term strategic investment, £120 billion, that's what we're asking for, but it connects Liverpool to Manchester to Bradford to Leeds to Hull to York. So this could be transformational for the region. So yes, we've done a In lot. In many decades. We need to do a, well, absolutely. These things take time. You can't do them overnight. But that's why you need a strategic approach. And that £120 billion is spread right from now till 2050 and includes things like Northern Powerhouse Rail, which is an absolute must. But if for we, us to if get we just look at the gap, if we, the IPPR uh, North Think Tank, have said that last year transport spending in our region was £315 per person in real terms. In London it was £1,000 and £19 per person in real terms. That's outrageous, isn't it? Absolutely right. Uh, and what actually happens, it's not about central government commitment. Central government commitments is spread, is spread pretty evenly through the country in terms of what go the central government does. Where London benefits, it has more local authority spending and more private sector investment. That's where they get their extra money from. What we need in the north is the government to pump prime that because all that relies on a very productive, prosperous economy. So people in London are 50% more productive and 50% 50, 50 more prosperous. That's what we want in the north. It's more better jobs, it's better businesses. We can do that, but it does require investment. And Rachel Maskell, you must back this sort of renewed interest in investment in our region. Well, it's absolutely crucial that we see the money going into the north. When we hear about transport, £63 billion more spent in the south than in the north over the last 10 years. And therefore, it's absolutely crucial that we get the right connectivity across the north and therefore putting the right investment, not seeing what the government have done, which is taking electrification off the railways, actually putting it back onto the railways to make sure that we get high speeds connecting our major cities between Leeds, Manchester and Sheffield, and then rolling out in further into the region, building a, a comprehensive public sector railway is very much my brief in, in the shadow transport team in focusing on how we enable people to bring that modal shift but also to attract the inward investment in business which our cities urgently need. Kevin Honrad, you were shaking your head there. Yeah, I mean we've electrified 25 times as much railway track in the last nine years than Labour did in 13. This is not about this government, it's about it decades, out decades as and well. decades of underinvestment. Rachel will probably concede that. It's been all governments, they focus no. too much on investment. Take on, Rachel? Is it too decades? much investments in is the South? 13 South years of underinvestment under, under Labour government? Well, uh, it's easy to play with the numbers when you exclude certain railways like HS1, where obviously we put the investment into the rail lines there. So I think what we need to do is to really look at how we get that connectivity, but also to match it with economic investment. And if I look at my own constituency of York Central, the plans which have just been passed through government um, have very much choked off the economic opportunity for real investment in, in growing our local economy and instead it will just see a reorganisation and we're a very low wage but highly expensive place to live and of course this isn't going to help my constituents to be able to move on and to have the prosperity which they deserve. Meanwhile Kevin Hollenrake, the front runner to be the next Prime Minister, is toying with the idea of scrapping HS2. What do you make of the fact that people in your party are even discussing scrapping it? Well, HS2 is one of these things where everybody seems to 
criticise it, and yet nine, out, nine people in the House of Commons vote for it against everyone that doesn't. So it's a bit, it's a, quite a strange situation. You personally. don't want to scrap it then? I don't want to scrap it. I think it's a case of it's not either or, it's both those things. It's HS3 or Northern Paris Rail and HS2. The key thing with HS2 is making sure we manage the budget properly. So it makes sense at about 50 billion quid, it doesn't make sense at 100 billion quid. So if there's a massive overspend, that's a different story. But if you can manage it properly, that's the right thing. In terms of economics in, in York, the best thing for York would be a, de a devolution deal for York City region, York and North Yorkshire. Then we can start s focusing locally on the economic imperatives You've got for to concede that, that, Rachel Maskell. George Osborne and this project have meant regional mayors in places like South well, Yorkshire. Well, I've very much been campaigning to ensure that the whole of Yorkshire can have that oversight, that strategic leadership, which our um, county needs, not just to compete and which nationally, but globally to and deliver. as well. Do you can see that they've... Well, we've been calling for the whole of Yorkshire to come together as one and to be part of, of being putting Yorkshire on the world stage of attracting that economic investment. So this isn't just about cutting up Yorkshire. We need that bigger vision for the whole of our and county. And you like the idea of a, a one Yorkshire mayor, one mayor in charge of the whole of the county? No, I don't like it at all. Far too big. 5.4 million people. It ended up a huge bureaucracy. That's not what you want. Elected mayors are local people who understand their locality, understand York, North Yorkshire, passionate about that and can make change, like Ben Houchin's doing in... Tees Valley, if you had a single mayor for the entire counties of Yorkshire, it'd be based in Leeds, it would attract all the investment into Leeds and into the big conurbations, when really we should be looking after York and North Yorkshire. Okay, well let's move on uh, from that at the moment. Uh, once again, whole communities in our region have been left devastated by flooding, something both of our guests know the effects of having experienced it in their own communities. This of course was Wayne Fleet in Lincolnshire, where the steeping burst its banks last week. Residents face months of living away from their homes and farmers have been left counting the cost. This is what Theresa May said about it at this week's Prime Minister's Questions. In recent days and weeks we've seen flooding across the country, and which has been particularly severe in Lincolnshire. I know the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to the work of the emergency services, our military, the Environment Agency and all those who have been working on the ground to support the communities affected. The government stands ready to respond and offer all assistance where required. Rachel Maskell, your constituents know the impact mm. of flooding. Are we doing enough? Well, far more needs to be done. And one of the promises that the government brought forward was that they were going to invest in the upper catchment management. So actually, you solve the problem at source through planting, through ensuring that we slow the flow of the river coming downstream. We haven't seen the investment going into the upper catchment piece, which would really be transformative when it comes to the impact it has on our cities. And it would actually mean um, you won't have to build the barriers which we are seeing now being invested in. So actually, you'll save money by putting the investment in the right place. But the government are scared to tread on that ground because of the grouse small shooting and other factors, which means that you manage the land in a very different way. And the, the academic evidence which <coughs> comes from the University of Leeds and the University of York has said there needs to be far more investment in upper catchment management schemes. Kevin Holland, you're scared? That was complete nonsense. Slow the flow no. was delivered in Pickering by this government in my constituency. It was a, it was a groundbreaking scheme, 30, 30 million pounds invested in that scheme. We've got another similar scheme in Calder Valley. It's exactly what Rachel's talking about, but we're delivering it. She's absolutely right. It's the right thing to do. There's no need to play party politics it's with this. It's not about party we're, politics. Well, it's about putting the exactly investment in which the, the national strategic plan exactly said it will do, and it, it hasn't put the well, comprehensive investment into that you strategy. You just said they not done it. Will, we, in no. the cap no, it that will be the in the next basin. comprehensive spending review, we were told, and the government has retracted back from that. Kevin Donnery? £45 million pounds spent in York, and another £17 That's million pounds by 2021. That. Another £17 million pounds on the on the Foss barrier. Mm -hmm. £50 million pounds in, in Leeds. A second phase of £65 million pounds coming on. Huge investments going into this. It's absolutely wrong to play party politics with it. We asked the government for a response on this. They said we are already providing £2.6 billion over six years, delivering more than 1,000 projects to better protect 300,000 homes. This is on top, they say, of £1 billion by 2020 to maintain flood defences. What do you make of that, Rachel Maskell? Oh, it's right that we see the investment, but the investment needs to go into the right places, and that's why this piece around upper catchment is really important. If we look at the weather we've had recently and the river rises in York, and we know that communities feel unsafe when happening that happens. More and more. It is it? happening more and more, and that's why if we put the investment in the right place, it means that our communities, the people that experience flooding, can carry on with their lives. And of course, the businesses get hit, and many businesses in York get regularly hit by flooding. So it's so
so important that we see investment in the right place. We were given the promise in the next comprehensive spending review. It seems that government have backtracked. Maybe Kevin, as, as an advisor in that department, will ensure that we will see that investment which was previously promised. Because, of course, you are an advisor to Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary, Kevin Honrake, and you, do must, you must see this as, a, as an increasing problem. Of course it is, definitely. Climate change is having an effect. And, and what we, Rich and I both see are the devastating consequences of flooding. You see it's at a human level are terrible. So no doubt we need to invest more, which is why we're investing more. 2.6 billion by 2021, as you just quoted. There'll be further spending from that. We're not backtracking on spending in flood defences. But you can't stop every flood. There was twice the amount of rain in Lincolnshire as there was in 2007 floods, a huge amount. And there'll be natural, natural problems, natural disasters. But we've got to manage them where we can. But simply pointing to this and saying that's a government's fault is not helpful. And do you think Rachel Maskell the government could be doing more on what Kevin well, describes as climate change? There are many things that the government could be doing. For instance, it's missed its target on tree planting, 71% of the target not actually being met. Tree planting we know does over a period of time, take more and more water out of flowing downstream. So it's these kind of measures, if you add them up in a cumulative way, could really have an impact on ensuring that our communities stay dry when those heavy rainfalls come. And it's really important that the government stick to its targets and, and puts its foot on the accelerator in addressing the causation as well and climate change obviously being at the heart of that. 11, mil of 11 million trees were planted by 2022. What Rachel's quoting is where we are today. You've got three more years yeah, to deliver that. Your target of but where you had said you were going to be today. Yeah, the centre of yeah. all of this, Rachel Maskell, Kevin Horan, is, is a hu lots of human stories and people having their lives really damaged by flooding. Mm. Absolutely, and of course, I, I, I know the pain which didn't just last for weeks, it went on for months and indeed years of, of many of my constituents. And we still haven't got an insurance scheme which is robust enough, particularly for businesses. And in, indeed, many businesses have gone out of um, our high streets as a result of not having a comprehensive insurance scheme. So maybe that's something else no, Kevin can that. work I on. I agree with we should be extending. There's a flood re scheme, we should be extending for, for businesses mm. and certainly for leasehold apartments. Leaseholders and yeah. well, some agreement there yeah, at least. Be. So last orders wouldn't be last orders without mentioning the B word. Believe it or not, the Brexit clock is still counting down to the October deadline when, in theory at least, we agree a deal or cut ties on WTO terms. But a certain leadership contest and the European elections, of course, the ones that were never supposed to happen, seem to have put efforts at finding a way forward on ice. Let's take a quick look at what happened. I think it's very clear that the electorates in the UK and in Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire are very angry and fed up with the way that the UK is being run right now. Divided parties don't win elections. Our, our party has, has proved that, that it has been uh, divided. We said we would um, be in favour of a public vote to settle that issue. We weren't clear enough on it and I think we need to make that message much clearer. All our campaign was positive and that really resonated with people. I think one thing we've learned is that there was this massive poverty of hope all across the country. The region itself voted more for uh, the main parties than it did for the Brexit party. But you know, I've got a clear mandate. I've got 200,000 voters that voted Double Democrats. So I've got a clear message. My platform was to stop Brexit. Kevin Hollenreich, what's the solution? We vote for a sensible deal, which is what we should have done in Parliament. Uh, and Rejected three times. Exactly. 90% of my colleagues voted for it, 10% did, didn't, and I think they'll, they may live to regret that because that deal should have been voted through. But I've got to say, only 2% of Labour members voted for it. Party mm. politics again got in the way. It was no, a sensible it deal, a good deal and we should have voted through. Instead of that, what Rachel wants to do, and the party will soon adopt, is a policy where you want a second referendum, which I think is a travesty, totally unfair on the people who are given the choice in 2016 whether to leave or not. Rachel Maskell, does Kevin Hollenrich have a point there about a second referendum not being what people in our region who mainly voted leave will want? Well, the point Kevin is making is that he campaigned for Remain and he has now changed his mind and he's enabling, having, by having a second vote, we're enabling people to reconsider the situation now that we know what it's 
about. Now we know the detail of what a deal could be about. And of course, none of us knew the contents of Theresa May's deal back in 2016. She's so got a point, hasn't she, Kevin? Yeah. I didn't, it, it isn't a case of changing my mind. It's a case of, we told the public, Rachel walked through the lobbies on a bill, an act of parliament, to say we should give the public the choice whether they could, should remain in the European Union or leave. I voted for that. We gave the people the choice. We should honour that choice. And my constituents voted overwhelmingly. That's irrelevant. It was a national my vote. My constituents have a right to have their voice heard in parliament. That's what they put me there to do. And it, my constituents voted overwhelmingly you voted to, give to remain. And as a result of that... It, it's right that I represent my constituents in Parliament by giving people that option of uh, voting on the final deal. I believe that everybody in this country has a right to say what they want. It isn't closing off those options. And your party's inching closer and closer to a formal position backing a second referendum. Absolutely. It's been, it's been a very confusing well, we, couple of years for Labour, hasn't it? Well, over the last three years, we've had the Conservative Party and now the Brexit Party saying we are going to get out of Europe and have ignored the half of the country that voted to remain. We've had but the Lib Dems... your party position has changed, we've hasn't had, it, over the, over the last couple of years? We've had the Lib Dems and the Greens... But your party in, position has if changed, If I can finish my point, well. ignoring half the country that voted to leave. We have spent three years going around the country listening to the country and when people say they voted for leave and reform and remain in reform it's the slowest u-turn in history isn't we it, have been taking hold of what that reform actually means we embedded that in our 2017 manifesto and we're building on that to ensure that we get the best for the uk for europe and our world as we move forward a radical transformation of politics meanwhile kevin hollandrake a yougov poll of conservative party members this week has suggested they'd sacrifice the union the economy and even their party if they could sacrifice Brexit. It is an obsession for your party, isn't well, it? I've never heard a Conservative, conservative member of, parla a member of the, our party say that. I mean, I don't know whether I saw that poll, I don't know who they asked or when well, they asked Most of your members are in the south of England, so maybe to understand well, the perspe perspective of, of, of sort of northern members and northern MPs. Well, the, mem mem the members of my party in Thurscombe Malton I, I not, do not hold those views by and large in my view. But the, others in your party in the south of England clearly do. Well, I can't speak for them and I can't speak for a poll that was conducted under, under terms I know not what. Yeah, but, but about 800, most, 900 I, I, people. For everybody I speak to is when I talk to them about the difficulties with Brexit, particularly the issues with Northern Ireland and, and the border, um, uh, and I explain the difficulties about it that, that might ensue in terms of a potential... Um, uh, for Northern Ireland, in terms of Northern Ireland, a breakup of the, uh, of the United Kingdom, people are very concerned about that, in my experience. Mm. So I don't think that's reflective of a general Conservative member. Briefly, Rachel Maskell, prediction for the autumn? Well, clearly, I think what we're going to see is a new leader of the Conservative Party move, trying to get a new deal in Europe, not able to achieve that, coming back to Parliament and then having to dissolve Parliament into a general election. OK, that's it for tonight. Thanks again to both my guests. We're back next month with the latest news and views from Westminster and who knows what might have happened by then. Thanks for watching. Good night.